I want to welcome everyone to uh, the conference, Communism, A New Beginning. Thank you very much for coming. Um, check out our website at versobooks.com for more information about our authors and all of their books. And there are books for sale outside. Uh, so I'm just going to, um, I'm sorry. Sure, that's fine. Uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the format. Uh, Slavoj is going to introduce uh, tonight's speakers. Uh, there's going to be a paper and then some debate. And after that first uh, paper and debate, we'll have a break, a, a 10 minute break. And then uh, come back and have uh, a second paper uh, and a debate. And we'll go till 9 o'clock tonight. So it's uh, Slavoj Zizek, Frank Ruda, and Bruno Bastille's reading a paper by Alan Badiou. Thanks so much for coming. So, welcome to our third meeting after London and Berlin. Where do we stand now? Just a couple of clarifications. There is a wonderful dialectical joke in Ernst Lubitsch's Ninochka. The hero visits a cafeteria and orders coffee without cream. The waiter replies, sorry, but we have run out of cream. We only have milk. Can I bring you coffee without milk? This is the first lesson. Uh, it is important to know what you will get here, but also what you will not get here. You will not get a plan for action, a reply to the Leninist question, what is to be done? Remember, this is a modest philosophical meeting, trying to clarify some basic theoretical points. As Bertolt Brecht put it, thinking always precedes acting. Acting without thinking is an impotent passage à l'acte. So, the first point to clarify is the name, communism. Why do we still cling to this name? After, as our critics say, all the horrors associated with it. And to add insult to injury, not just socialism, but communism. Even some friends of mine tell me, isn't this bad PR, but bad public relations? Like, can you, can't you sell the same stuff but use socialism, solidarity, whatever, just not that name? So again, what's in a name? Recall, sorry, cannot step out of my nature, recall the old Polish anti-communist joke. Socialism is the synthesis of the highest achievements of all previous historical epochs. From tribal society, it takes barbarism. From antiquity, it takes slavery. From feudalism, it takes relations of domination. From capitalism, it takes exploitation. And from socialism, it takes the name. <laughs> Unfortunately, we must say that for much of 20th century communism, something like that has an element of truth. But nonetheless, and this is maybe one of the tasks of our conference here, I think this is why I'm here, this is why we are here, it's not as simple as that. We should stick to this name, even if at the times of turmoil and new beginning, like today, this name often sounds an empty name. Like, what do you want? What do you really want? Can you give us a program? Maybe at the beginning, you precisely cannot give a program. We should also take this approach, I think, to Wall Street protests. Many well-meaning critics say, but what do these guys really want? Well, the problem is that we live within a certain ideological universe. If they were to know perfectly what they want, this would have meant one simple thing, that what they want can be simply translated into predominant ideological coordinates. You have to begin with an empty gesture. Or as, at least ad let's admit that what Marx says about capitalism, that in the development of capitalist production, formal subsumption under capital precedes material subsumption. The same goes here. So what are then our minimal coordinates? Just 
an indication of, I hope, even this is open for debate, something that all of us share here. First, being a communist today implies, I think, solidarity with a certain past, a certain millenarian tradition of those at the bottom rebelling. Often this is, of course, dismissed as, uh, as a proto-totalitarian, uh, uh, fundamentalist, uh, uh, messianic, whatever tradition. Uh, we have, I think, to be solidary with that. We are in the line, as they say, from Spartacus to Thomas Mincher and so on and so on. But, of course, there is always a but, we also have to rethink a much more unpleasant part of the legacy inscribed into, under the term communism, Stalinism and so on. What does all this mean? Second feature, we are approaching here clearly, we, by me, I mean the global capitalist system, a certain deadlock. Inner antagonisms of capitalist system are exploding. But at the same time, it is clear that the solution is not simply a return to some kind of Marxian orthodoxy. The very basic tenets of Marxism, let's just, let me just mention the notion of exploitation, have to be rethought today. Third feature that I hope we share, a certain discontent. It's not just that the system is in crisis, people rebel. There is a certain rage, protest, and so on. But again, we have to rethink who is the subject of this protest. It's clearly not the simple old proletariat. And the last point, a certain minimal vision. This may be already problematic to some of you. Although we protest capitalist global dynamics, I think to be today a communist means that there is no return to the old, in the sense of how structured it should be to, to protect some old forums uh, against being swept away by capitalist modernization. For example, I was recently in India, and uh, I was told by some cultural critics there that, listen, in today's global capitalist turmoil, our caste system is all we have. It may appear inegalitarian, but my God, this is all we have. We, we have to stick to it. It's the most precious element of our tradition. I told them, no, precisely because it means all to you, you have to sacrifice that. I think this is the ABC of being a communist, that you have to go to the end through capitalist modernization. There is no way back. That's enough to conclude I will just add an organizational note. Two of our, as you may have noticed if you check the last program, two of our comrades from France, Emmanuel Terre and Talem Badiou, couldn't come for health reasons. Here is a short letter from Alain Badiou. He asked me to read it to you. Dear friends, after long and painful deliberations, I decided to cancel my voyage to New York. The accumulated reasons are of a disparate nature. Family reasons, my children are in serious troubles. Professional reasons, academic obligations in France. Editorial reasons, book by and on me will appear this month. Political reasons, I am part of the struggle of the African workers in France. But all these reasons would not be enough if I were in a good physical condition, which is not the case. I am now subjected to multiple medical examinations and more are planned. In such conditions, a long voyage full of passionate events would be madness. To renounce it is for me nonetheless something of a defeat, but I have to deal with my body. Sadly, old age exists. So I am really sorry that I cannot honor my engagements. We shall meet for sure, the sooner the better. In any case, long live thinking. With all my passionate friendship, Alain. End of the letter. Where, well, as you can imagine, I wrote him a short message back, recalling the wonderful, weird message of 
Gor Lenin to Gorky when Lenin discovered of Gorky's illness and that Gorky doesn't take care of himself properly. Lenin said, are you aware that in our socialist system, your working ability to write is state property? So if you are not taking care of your health, you are involved in treasonous activity of, 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 of uh, treating bad precious state property. I wrote this to Alain, tell him, beware, don't follow the path of treason. He accepted it. So uh, to return to the beginning, to coffee, what is served here is coffee without but you, maybe, but not coffee without liberal humanitarians, coffee without humanists, and so on, and so on. So let's start drinking this coffee the first serving by Frank Ruda. And I want to show to you, before I introduce him, he's one of our young colleagues, I think maybe the most promising philosopher of the younger generation in, from Germany. Uh, a really great book just appeared in English, also by him in continuum, Hegel's Rebel, Pöbel, you know this, no class class, the, the outcasts of all castes, of all classes. It's a wonderful book, a detailed study of Hegel, which focuses on this mysterious notion of rebel, where Hegel shows his limitations, but also his greatness, how capitalism necessarily produces this excess. The greatness of the book is not just a historical study. It's at the same time, it at the same time uses in a prismatic way this notion of rebel and those paragraphs in Hegel's philosophy of right, which deal with rebel, as a kind of a entrance point to enter the very core of dilemmas which haunt Hegelian dialectics. And at the same time, the point of the book is not, not just the old standard traditional point with rebel, Hegel came close to Marxist position, but wasn't yet able to think proletarian and so on and so on. The book is much more radical. It claims that in today's conditions of favelas excluded, those who are not allowed in and so on, the Hegelian notion of rebel acquires a new actuality. So I'm really proud here to present you my good friend and colleague Frank Ruda. Um, thanks very much for more than the more than kind words. I'm very happy to be here. I'm starting uh, in his absence, maybe even more adequately, with a quotation by a very short quotation by Alain Badiou, which uh, runs as follows: "The problem is to have an idea." Unquote. Today, communism seems impossible, and it also seems as if all the word communism throughout its history stood for will never again experience something like a new beginning. Communism as a name for overcoming the dreadful division and specialization of labor, which lies at the ground of the division of society into antagonistic classes, as name for a different form of organization, i.e. a non-statist one, and finally as name for the equality of whomever with whomever seems to be radically invalidated by all the attempts to put it into practice and give it a concrete practical existence. At least this is what the sirens of the dominant ideology, which one might call with but you democratic materialism, blaze on forth everywhere. Non-statism is only a valid principle when dealing with market dynamics and the maximizing of individual profits. Despecialization of labor forces is nothing but a sign of underdevelopment and an equality of people which differs from the abstract equality of the people who are able to buy the same things of anyone with anyone is nothing but an old and maybe quite stinky utopian hat. It is as if in 1923, Georg Lukacs was rather thinking of our times when he wrote in his History and Class Consciousness, quote, in this way, the very thing that should be understood becomes the accepted principle by which to explain all phenomena, namely the unexplained facticity of bourgeois existence as it is here and now, or might today say, 
of democratic materialist existence as it is here and now, and acquires the patina of an eternal law of nature enduring for all time." Unquote. What we have, even if it is experiences, uh, experiencing a crisis after the other, seems to be all that there is, um, <clears throat> all that is thinkable. The word communism thus names something which here and now seems to be unthinkable. Communism is impossible. History has proven so. So it cannot be, or more precisely, it should not be thought. It should not be thought what happened and was experienced within history under this name. And it should not be thought if there could be a communist, a new communist beginning, as communism represents nothing but endless crimes and terrorist regimes. What is, is all there is. And although it's not perfect, it's the least worse. Uh, worse imaginable. Frederick Jameson diagnosed one consequence of this naturalization, as I want to call it, of the given there is as follows. Today, he claimed, it seems far more plausible to the majority of people that a comet will hit Earth than that there could be the slightest possibility of a change within the predominant, i.e., capitalist system. Today, it seems that the only comet which might not come from outer space but from inner stems from the, as one likes to call it these days, the grief of morally degenerated investment bankers being pushed to moral degradation by the very system that they are working for. And to avoid the catastrophic effects of their wrongdoing, all we need is a good dose of ethical responsibility backed up by economical rating agencies so, we, so that we get rid of the predators and live a happy life. And this then would finally be capitalism with a human face. But today, not only communism seems impossible. One can easily find strands within philosophy which also seem to be radically outdated and invalidated by history. Who the hell would still really defend a full-blown Cartesian, Hegelian, or a Platonist position today after all the so famous turns, the linguistic turn, the performative, etc., after all the pragmatist interventions and the predominance of ordinary language or analytical philosophy of mind to court? Interestingly enough, even capitalists today seem to admit that there is a certain something to the thought of Marx, but not really uh, to the thought of Plato, Descartes, and Hegel. We seem to be in a situation after the validity of the idea of communism and a philosophical situation, which is also one of an after. It is structured in a way that we're thinking after a phase in which we were able to believe in, for example, eternal ideas, irrefutable truths, absolute knowledge, or the dualism of being and appearing. When we were able to do so, we also were still able to believe in communism as something irrefutable, eternal. But now the situation is quite, has quite changed. We seem to have no choice. Who, for example, in the world, except for some few militant thinkers who largely seem to be more or less based in Slovenia, really attempt to defend a Hegelian position without any constraints? Being a Hegelian is fine, but one needs to get rid of the traumatic kernel addressed under the notion of absolute knowledge, as we're all finite, and have no access to anything absolute. Within the philosophical field, the only possible Hegelian position today is one based upon a liberal reading of his so-called theory of mutual recognition. What is made out of Hegel today in this liberal interpretation culminates in the abolishment of his most fundamental claims into historicism, relativism, and an extrapolation of the social domain within which, as they have it, Hegel has shown that we need to respect the other's opinions that are referred to as normative commitments, and that intersubjectivity lies at the ground of every practice. And thus, all there is are relative and historically varying practices. Nothing trans-historical canon will ever be revealed, although Hegel himself wrongly thought so. Only in this castrated way, as one might claim, Hegelianism can still be tolerated today, and the same goes for, the most, for most of the fundamental claims articulated by Descartes, for example, with regards to the subject of the cogito, the existence of truths, or by Plato, with regards to the disciplined organization of a society ruled by guardians and the philosopher king, who is considered to be a clear symptom of Plato's totalitarianism, or the existence of something which does not coincide with a normal, sensible sphere. Thus, ideas like the distinction of eternity and appearance, the soul and the body, and everything that smells of dualism seem to be as radically outdated, as impossible, as the idea of communism seems to be. 
We're in a situation after communism and after what has been thought by Plato, Descartes, and Hegel under names as idea, cogito, and so forth. It's just not possible to be a philosopher, develop a moral theory of nice mutual recognition, and do at the same time propaganda for communism, as communism clearly never stood for something just relative, that nice, or mutual. It always has been scandalous in some sense and delineated an organization which in many ways was beyond good and evil, to use Nietzsche's vocabulary, an organization for and maybe even of eternity, an organization which at least in principle aimed at putting the impossibility of inegalitarian statements and actions into practice. So to link the diagnosis of the political domain to that of the philosophical situation, one might claim the following. One essential category, which in politics appears under the signifier communism, and within philosophy under the names of Plato, Descartes, and Hegel, is the category of the impossible. This does not imply that Plato, Descartes, and Hegel are communist thinkers, but what is suppressed when their position is attacked is something that is also attacked under the name of communism, i.e. something that presented itself as non-relativist, non-historicist, which is to say, in some way, eternally true. The question I want to address today is quite a fundamental one. What is the task of philosophy in times where the impossible within politics and philosophy, although in quite different guises, prevails? Where to begin when one takes the question of a new beginning of communism to be a philosophical question? These two questions are also quite closely related to some that my dear friend and comrade Jan Fölker, who is also there today, and I have addressed under the title of a moral provisoire for our time, so in certain sense it's a link to that. Today, after the disappearance of idealism and what might be again or still called the death of God, we all became materialists. And the contemporary form of materialism that is offered to us knows two fundamental axioms, and I'm here referring to but you. They're only bodies and languages, or they're only individuals and uh, <clears throat> communities. Idealism is passé, over, and one calls idealists those who have not yet been educated properly by the objective laws of the contemporary world, mostly fools within philosophy. There is no choice but to be materialist. But as you formulated, one of the most basic fundamentals which democratic materialism relies upon is the following. Live without an idea. Living without an idea then seems to be the predominant imperative, common to all, enjoy without boundaries, be flexible, and so forth slogans. A life without an idea implies the reduction of life to survival. But why is there a problem with the materialist conviction that man is unable to live for anything but his own interest? Already the early Marx criticized one effect of this sort of ideology by insisting that capitalism reduces human animals to the substratum of their animality. Today, democratic materialism leads to precisely the same result as I want to claim. But how should this be possible as we seem to act in a quiet, human manner whilst buying Apple products, consuming Starbucks coffee, or enjoying internet porn? I want to argue that there can be and there is a regress from humanity to animality, a privation. But at the same time, I want to defend the thesis, and this is one claim of what I will call metacritical analysis, that there is no relation between the human and the animal. Or to put it in more dialectical terms, there is no relation between the human and the animal, but there is something like a human animal, which is the embodied incorporation of this very non-relation between the human and the animal. Human animals are embodiments of this non-relation, so there is no pure non-relation, which is important to keep in mind. This thesis will hopefully get clearer in the development of my argument. So again, why today are human animals reduced to their animality? As you may all know, but your thesis is that capitalism is the regime that takes the fact that man is at the same time an animal the utmost serious. It offers a model of everyday life and an understanding of what the subject is, which defines human beings only via their animal constitution. Their body as bodies can be defined and are thus naturalized. We all seem to, be, uh, we all seem to very well know what a body can and needs. The contemporary capitalist idea of the subject is a biosubjective model of embodied subjectivity, and man ultimately is considered to be, I quote by you, a biped without feathers whose charms are not obvious, unquote. 
Capitalism reduces every body to its commercial capacities, its particular interests, its small de desires, petty fetishisms, and thereby produces a generalized commercial animality. Capitalism presents an encompassing system which, as already Marx described it when he spoke about the worker being reduced to the mere functioning of his stomach, impoverishes anyone to his bodily animal, and this is to say, purely abstract, organic constitution. The contemporary imperative is to live one's life in a purely bodily, this is to say, animal manner, without an idea, and the image of humanity capitalism presents is a historically specific construction and an ideological interpretation of what a body is, which is based upon the conviction, for example, that there is something like one body that one has. The simple continuation of life, i.e. survival, means nothing but that we are put in a position of passive subjects, and one can easily see why thereby passive numbers, for example, of voters, are considered to be quite important. What capitalist materialist ideology produces is the abstract equality of individually circulating, objectified animal bodies that share the same biological constitution and can circulate in the same way objects do. And they circulate on what is for Badiou the contemporary name of the non-world uh, that we live in, the market. This is why, as he claimed, democracy became, I quote, the emblem and custodian for a conservative oligarchy whose main and often bellicose business is to guard its own territory as animals do under the usurped name world, unquote. It is this reduction that suspends, diminishes the world and leaves behind a mere environment with which at the same time anyone has to be quite concerned. In the last instance, this yields the humdrum claptrap of environmental or human right concerns which present themselves as right of the species. And this is because the reduction of human being to its animal species life comes with one threat any species faces, domestication. For the simple ex negative definition of what a species is, it is that which can be <coughs> domesticated. And the mode of democratic materialist domestication as ideological project is precisely the naturalist reduction to animality, which I want to call animal humanism. Animal humanist life is subjectively impoverished, even when one is lucky and objectively it seems quite rich. A life without an idea, or to put it differently, a life without thought in a certain sense. Capitalism produces indifference, the abstract and objective bodily equality of human animals within the environment of the market in which they compete with one another. And this material production of indifference, anyone becomes a self-seeking animal body trying to be the better predator in the shared environment, works even better because it ex adapted, to use Stephen Jay Gould's term, the perfect state form to realize it, democracy. Today, the form of democracy is conditioned by the capitalist content, and the form of capitalism is conditioned by the democratic content. Capitalist content in democratic form presents itself in the dominance of interests, desires, and finally, in the animal and beastly constitution of man within all contemporary political debates, human rights, and so forth, and ultimately in what I named animal humanism. Democratic content in capitalist form presents itself in most practical interpretation of democratic principles, for example, of freedom as the freedom of the worker to sell its own labor. This is what de uh, democratic materialism comes down to, or as one consequence. If any state is, as but you claimed, indifferent towards equality, the capitalist democratic state form organizes the produced abstract equality, which is indifferent towards singularities by, I quote Slavoj, the processes of free election that are an organized indifference with regards to any point of the real, unquote. And this is itself considered to be a realization of freedom. From this, one can infer why today the category of the possible became an instrument of oppression. Why should that be? For in politics, the reliance on the possible shows eventually three consequences. First, it shows that the privilege of the possible implies to have always already opted for one model of change, change as an extension of the possible. Second, it shows that this process of extension implies that equality can only be thought gradually as gradually realized state of the expanded regime of the possible. But one might remember here the French slogan, tout ce qui bouge n'est pas rouge, not everything that moves is really red. And third, it shows that siding with the possible, 
inevitably implies siding with the primacy of inequality over equality due to the fact that there is always something that seems impossible to a given realm of the possible. As siding with the possible implies that the change of the framework of what seems possible itself becomes impossible. No, this is, follows from the first principle that there is only one possible model of change. It seems impossible to transform the situation in any other way than extending, than by extending the possible, and thereby one ends up with a historically specific and circum circumscribed realm of possibilities which can be actualized. To extend in a seemingly infinite manner what is possible is already to accept one final borderline of this very extension. This is why communism seems impossible, impossible to organize the impossibility of inegalitarian statements here and now. But this is what communism, at least in principle in its history, stood for. Today, the possible is nothing but a stable and status regime that, although it constantly seems to change, never truly changes. In other words, to side with the regime of the possible is to support a return to the actual state of things and to stick forever to the actual and existing state. This is also why it delineates a circumscribed realm of thinkability. Consequently, the seemingly infinite extension of the possible is necessarily limited and finitized by an always historically specific impossibility that it naturalizes as much as it naturalizes itself. Insisting on what seems possible is thereby to redouble the impossibility. There's a general impossibility of changing the extension of the possible, and this always implies the impossibility of organizing impossible inegalitarian statements. This is why communism is presented as impossible. Starting with the possible means to naturalize it and also to naturalize the impossibility it encounters. This is because the most fundamental paradigm of the possible today has become the natural. Naturalization signifies that the only orientation offered by the possible is inscribed in the axiomatic equation of, I quote from Badiou's Logics of World, existence equals individual equals body, unquote. What is possible is what is bodily and individually natural. What is possible is what is there in the bodies that exist as naturally determined by their needs and so forth. The capitalist materialism of the possible in the last instance is a materialism of the biological and animalist body that stands under the paradigm of the natural, the naturalized possible, one might say. So to resume my point so far, animal humanism is a direct outcome of the ideology of democratic materialism, which is a materialism without an idea, that leads to the most radical, i.e. material reduction of humans to their animal substructure and presents an immense production and organization, moreover, an administration of indifference. The abstract uniformity of individual and collective circulating bodies produces an abstract equivalence and indifference of these very bodies. But what to do with, the, with this from the perspective of philosophy? The answer I want to offer is, Philosophy to not remain within academia and to avoid the pure administration of knowledge, the university discourse, so to speak, has to be engaged philosophy. It has to intervene to clarify the situation. And it can do so against the dominant current if it assumes the task of, I, of what I want to call metacritical analysis. And if the question of a new beginning of communism can be treated as a philosophical question, it thus has to be treated as a question of metacritical analyses. So my main task is to elaborate what metacritical analyses is and specify its relation to communism. What I will present in the following are first and radically preliminary remarks on the metacritical analyses of communism. But what I will be able to develop here today is nothing but a prolegomena of something which would need much more elaboration. So the metacritical analysis of communism as answer to the question of communism's new beginning is, it shall, is itself just beginning. But, one, <clears throat> but I can state one thing. If today communism is something which seems impossible, any, any metacritical and anamnetical approach to communism has to deal with what seems impossible. To start with my proposal, I can say that a metacritical analysis consists of three different momentums structuring my presentation. It entails first, what I will call an idealism without idealism. Second, a dialectics of dialectics and non-dialectics. And third, a Cartesian stance for the 21st century. Philosophy as metacritical analysis is, as you will see, a concept that I can uh, consider to be quite in line with the stance represented by the works of Badiou. 
So first part, idealism without idealism. One can claim that, that given the predominance of democratic materialism today, the old ideological battle, to put it with Althusser, between idealism and materialism that always determined philosophy gains a new face. With the complete withering away of idealism, one can claim that the split that separated idealism from materialism today reappears inside materialism. This is what I take to be one possible rendering of how one might conceive of the distinction between, between democratic materialism and materialist dialectics that Badiou, but also Slavoj have introduced. If idealism is impossible, the only thinkable option is materialism, but as materialism still is an ideological atmosphere, as Badiou has it, one could assume that the repetition of the distinction of idealism and materialism inside materialism brings forth an idealist materialism, a bad one, and a good and proper materialist materialism. Nevertheless, I want to argue that the contemporary inscription of the distinction between idealism and materialism into the domain of materialism itself should be framed in a more dialectical way. To cut a long story short, I will claim that one can and should differentiate between two forms of materialism, but that the inscription of the distinction of idealism and materialism into it contains a momentum of reversal. A moment which materialistically reverses the distinction of good and bad materialism within materialism itself, or better, it introduces a moment of torsion within materialism. Following Badiou, I will argue that the democratic materialism can be understood as materialism without an idea, and materialism without idealism, and that any materialist dialectical approach should be conceived of as an idealism without idealism. One starting point to begin can be found in Descartes. One finds a remarkable passage in his meditations on first philosophy. There he asks why it is that we can be deceived at all. And one part of the answer he gives is that there can be error and mistake due to the attribute in which I am the most godlike, the, will, uh, the freedom of my will. I can be mistaken because I'm free. I'm quoting Descartes. When the will is considered not relationally, but strictly in itself, God's will does not seem any greater than mine, unquote. But this essentially means that the freedom of my will is so infinite that it can even will two radically incompatible things. In a famous letter from 1644, Descartes uh, writes in line with that, quote, even if God had wanted that some truths are necessary, this is not at all to say that he was forced to do so. For to will that they are necessary and to necessarily will or be forced to will is not the same thing, unquote. Already Jean-Paul Sartre insisted that God in Descartes is so free that his freedom is identified with radical contingency. Freedom is the contingency of creating a world in one way or another. Descartes' point thus is that my will is so free that I can will A and non-A at the same time. The Cartesian philosophy of the subject thereby begins by confronting what he articulates as follows. I quote, I can be free without being inclined both ways. Indeed, the more strongly I incline in one direction, the more free is my choice. When no reason inclines me in one direction rather than the other, I have a feeling of indifference. That is, of it's not mattering which way I go, and that is the poorest kind of freedom." Unquote. His point is that one is only, or to the most degree, radically free when one takes side. sides. Freedom is side-thinking, not the insistence of the on the possibility of possible choices. It is only real, realized in a decision, not in the abstract existence of the two sides of a choice in which one might dwell forever. It consists, as one might say with Badiou, in treating a point, in a decision which condensates all the alleged differences into one single choice. Th thus, freedom consists in choosing and in pursuing the consequences of this choice. For Descartes, this means that I can only err when, I'm, when I already misperceived what the nature of my freedom is. This is the case when I mistake my own nature as a possibility to will A and non-A at the same time. So when I only remain in the domain of this yes and no, A and non-A, at the same time, I'm not free. It is the reason for me to become indifferent. And this is one way to understand the fundamental effect of the contemporary democratic materialist ideology as production of indifference. Democratic materialism is a biomaterialism of the possible of indifference abolishing true choice. One can thus learn from Descartes 
that philosophy has to intervene against this indifference. Philosophy is engaged philosophy against indifference. And although I do not have the time to develop this here in detail, but when what you claim is that politically we are in the same situation as Marx was in the 1840s, what one can infer is that in a certain sense, philosophically, we are in the same situation as Descartes was in the 1640s. Philosophy has to creatively repeat the Cartesian gesture against indifference. But I will return to this point at the end. As soon as I very well know that I feel as if I do A, but nevertheless do non-A, as soon, to take up Slavoj's example, as I think I partake in a collective project whilst buying a cappuccino at Starbucks, and conceive of this as very incarnation of my freedom, I become indifferent in a very fundamental sense. Or to put Descartes' more, uh, claim into even more dialectical terms, if my own freedom is that which makes me the most godlike, it is precisely not something natural as today democratic materialism claims. It is rather something which in myself, although I am also a natural being, is a natural, anti-natural, a natural. It is the other, the inhuman within the subject, as but you put it once. Why is that? Freedom is my nature, and it is what makes me godlike, but God is the creator of nature. Thereby, his and thus my freedom cannot be just natural. So Descartes' point is, human beings are free beings whose very nature is something anatural, but who are at the same time able to misperceive their own anatural nature in a way which suspends this very nature by naturalizing it. As I claim, there is no relation between the human and the animal. There are two different substances, as one can say with Descartes, but there is such a thing, such a, a thing as a human animal which is an embodiment of this non-relation. And embodiment then means there is a material incarnation of this without relation. And this embodiment of non-relation is an embodiment of freedom, one can learn from Descartes, a natural incorporation of something a natural. So against the naturalization of freedom, which is the reduction of human, human animals to the animal embodiment under democratic materialism, one should insist on the necessary a naturality of freedom, which makes the human animal into a human animal. Freedom, therefore, demands a true choice, hard work, discipline, and strict organization in pursuing its consequences. This is, as I take it, what communism, at least in principle, always was about. One might also say that democratic capitalist materialism somehow works like the genius malignum, the evil genius in Descartes. Maybe it is the most evil genius imaginable, as capitalism takes the body-soul distinction and extrapolates the body. Or to put it in more Cartesian terms, in a passage after he came to the famous ego sum, ego existu in his meditations, he reflects on the statement and claims, quote, I am, I exist, this is certain. But for how long? For as long as I'm thinking, but perhaps no longer than that. For it might be that if I stopped thinking, I would stop existing, and I have to treat that, this possibility as though it were actual, unquote. The reduction in capitalism might be said to function in line with this reflection. It deceives us in a way that we, as embodiments of the non-relation, think we do not exist in another than bodily way, which is to say that we very well know that we exist as human animals, but nevertheless we act as if, it were, uh, as if we were not. We act only in an animal-like fashion as animals who do no longer dare to think. Here one can turn to Plato and clarify what philosophy in times can learn from an utter idealist for assuming an unethical task. The lesson learned from Descartes is the following. To avoid becoming indifferent, the human animal has to be reminded that its very nature, its freedom, is a natural. Human animals are an embodiment of the non-relation between the human and the animal, natural incarnations of a naturality. And this a natural nature is only real when it takes sides, when it decides upon something. This insight even made it to Hollywood movie, uh, to Hollywood recently, for as one of the characters in Zack Snyder's 2011 movie Sucker Punch stated, I quote, if you do not stand for something, you fall for anything, unquote. But when does one really stand for something to address this question via Snyder and Descartes? Here the idealist Plato can help. As but you has underlined, his fundamental question was, what is a good life, or what is a life worthy of an idea? This is the question of philosophy for Herbert you, and the question of Plato. 
So one first answer that one can give with Plato is one stands for something when one sticks, upholds, and clings to an idea. And as Badiou continues to explain, an idea always stands in the position of an exception to the simple existence of what there is to the individual bodies, collective languages, and opinions. An idea always is the somehow scandalous, inhuman, anatural exception to the given natural realm of opinions. <coughs> Turning to Plato, one might claim that the first task of philosophy in our contemporary times is to work for the resurrection of an idea against the omnipresent reduction, naturalization we're facing. And as we're living in a time where there seems to be no idea, philosophy has to work for its resurrection, for a new beginning of the idea addressed under the name of communism. Thus, it is precisely the idea of an idea one needs to resurrect from idealism under present materialist conditions. This is how to inscribe the distinction of materialism and idealism within materialism itself. It is not a simple renaissance of idealism, as we're in a situation where we can only be materialists. But it means to materialistically invert materialism itself, to oppose the materialism without an idea that leads to animal humanism, with the materialism of the idea of an anatural inhuman freedom. This works by the introduction of a true two, of that which is there on the one side, one, and of an exception on the other. Yes, there is only individual and collective animal humanist life, except that there is an idea of truth or a true idea of communist life. This is, <clears throat> um, this could be considered a renaissance of idealism under present uh, materialist conditions, and it could be characterized by a formula that you once used to describe his own enterprise. In a text called Metaphysics, Metaphysics and the Critique of Metaphysics, he referred to his project as Metaphysics Without Metaphysics. And I would like to suggest then what you con should conceive of the philosophical act reinscribing the distinction of idealism and materialism into materialism along these lines. Philosophy as dialectic materialist then would be or entail an idealism without idealism. This is precisely why philosophy today, following by you, has to be, this is my, my thesis, and anethical. For any idea, this is what one can learn from Plato is good, and philosophy has to remind us of that. That this seems right now impossible does not matter, as it seemed impossible before. No one really believed in radical transformation in the 1840s, which were, um, as per you has pointed out, compared to our situation. So philosophy can and should recall the impossible that already more than once became possible. But for this anamnesis, historical specificity is of the utmost importance. One needs to take into account the experiences, or bluntly put, the failures already existing and learn from them without drawing the Thermidorian consequence of predominant, predominant materialism that any attempt to realize a universal collective good ultimately leads to the realization of the worst. So although it is true that we're thinking after Plato, Descartes, and Hegel, we have to avoid the obscurantism of a naturalized possibility, impossibility distinction, which reduces all of us to our animal substratum and to a life without any collective project, or, as one might say, without any relation to anything absolute. Philosophy has to be anamnesis under historically specific conditions and to remind us that the impossible, for example, under the name communism, already has been possible a couple of times before. For already Descartes' philosophical method was directed against any form of deception or failure in judgment. He famously started to doubt anything which ever deceived him and could thus not be trusted. One might say, in a similar way, can philosophy remind us today that the evil genius of capitalism and democratic materialism can and also should not be trusted. Or, as Hegel once claimed in his aesthetics, the human is the only animal which knows it is only an animal, and to, to this very knowledge, it is more than an animal. Philosophy's task is to keep this knowledge alive. One might learn from Plato, philosophy is linked to anamnesis. It has to remind us of the fact, as one might put it, that we're embodiments of the non-relation, and that it is in our nature to be able to do the unnatural, the impossible, and that we're able to live under an idea. It, <clears throat> It thus can emancipate us from reductive naturalization, but therefore a further element is needed, uh, dialectics of dialectics and non-dialectics. 
So how to ensure the historical concreteness of this anamnetical task? For idealism without idealism is only one part of uh, philosophy's job today. One needs to consider the precise historical situation we're in, and uh, as I already mentioned, it seems to be quite comparable, at least from a Badusian standpoint, to the 1840s. For today, no one knows what communism could mean. And this is why we have to reinstate, rework the hypothesis, in a certain sense, rewrite the theses on Feuerbach, and even maybe come up with a new manifesto. But what the early Marx did also was he dealt with Hegel. More precisely, he reworked Hegelian dialectics and especially the concept of negation. Think, for example, of his famous definition of the proletariat as negation of everything that the bourgeoisie includes in its definition of human being. If we're in a comparable situation, philosophy then could be said to have to repeat Marx. It has to work through dialectics, i.e. its motor negation. This can bring out a new and renewed materialist dialectics able to newly conceive of the impossible in our singular historical condition. In an important article, but you offered in my view first outlines how to do so. He therein distinguishes three forms of negation that provide essential coordinates for renewed materialist dialectics. The first form of negation he introduces is the classical one that can be found in Aristotelian metaphysics. Aristotle shows that thinking in general is determined by three principles. First, the principle of identity. Any proposition is equivalent to itself, i.e. to its truth content. Second, the principle of contradiction. It is impossible that in the same context, the proposition A and the proposition non-A can be true at the same time. Third, the principle of excluded middle. For a, proposi a proposition A holds that is either true or false. Either A is true or non-A is true. Negation in this model is structured in a twofold way. First, it has the power of exclusion. The proposition A excludes the validity of the proposition non-A. Secondly, it has the power of a forced decision inherent to it. Either A or non-A is valid. There is no third option. For classical negation never holds that yes and no are valid at the same time, and it always holds that either yes or no is valid. <coughs> Excuse me. But as one can easily see, there are not only classical forms of negation within the framework of these three principles, one can deduce others. Negation is only classical when it follows the principle of contradiction and the principle of excluded middle. One can also think of a negation that only follows the principle of contradiction but not the principle of the excluded middle, of a negation that follows the principle of excluded middle, but not the principle of contradiction, and finally of a negation that follows neither of the two principles. This last form of negation, in a certain sense, loses all the power of negation um, because it neither pres prescribes the decision nor does it exclude anything. It knows negation only as itself negated. The second form of negation, only following the principle of contradiction, but not of excluded middle, is what Badiou calls the intuitionist logic of negation. The third, only following the principle of excluded middle, but not of contradiction, he calls paraconsistent. It is important to note that for Badiou, the classical notion, uh, logic of negation, corresponds to the discourse of ontology. Because for his definition of being qua being, the principle of extensionality is fundamental. An element of a set, belongs to a set or does not belong to it, quite simple. Either A, the element belongs to the set is true or false, there is no third option. The difference between two multiplicities can thus be followed only from the fact that one element of one set is not the element of another. If one accepts this framework for the moment, this means that any form of negation that complies with the principle of contradiction and of excluded middle is not only classical, but also ontological. What is then the status of the intuitionist log logic of negation? But use answer is it is the logic of appearance. The ontological determination of what a multiple is can be distinguished from how it appears, with which intensity, if it appears in the shadow or the light. Although one can show that the intuitionist logic of negation is grounded in the classical one, because something cannot appear absolutely and with maximal intensity and at the same time not appear, it is not true that in the realm of appearances, one has to decide between A and non-A. A multiplicity cannot appear and not appear at the same time, but it can appear in multiple ways or intensities. There's a multiplicity of third options. Therefore, the principle of contradiction is valid, but not the principle of excluded middle. 
A can appear as B between the absolute appearance um, and the absolute non-appearance. This form of negation is therefore not only intuitionist, but also linked to the discourse of appearance, that is, phenomenology. For the third form of negation, the paraconsistent one, following the principle of excluded middle, but not of contradiction, one has to introduce, besides ontology and phenomenology, that what Badiou calls an event. An event is related as well to being as to appearance. Thus, one can ask, first, what sort of multiplicity does an event name ontologically? And second, how does an event appear phenomenally? First, an event is a contradictory multiplicity whose definition is to belong to itself. This means on the level of ontology, an event is neither classical, it does not comply with the principle of contradiction, nor intuitionist. From this perspective, it can be called paraconsistent. But an event might be in itself nothing but paraconsistent, but its definition contains another point. It is nothing but the ensemble of the consequences it will have produced. It is measured only by the consequences it will have been able to generate and can therefore only be thought in the linkage of being and appearances. Because if the event not to be a transcendent intervention is itself nothing substantial, one has to claim that the only thing that appears are its consequences. So how does an event appear? Phenomenally, it is the identity, again a, para a paradoxical um, definition, of appearance and disappearance. It is the vanishing mediator that thus appears paraconsistent as yes and no, appearing and disappearing. But this does not change the fact that one can only decide what it will have been if one considers if it had concrete consequences or not. Therefore, its ontologically paraconsistent form necessitates a decision. When it is not clear if something happened or not, a decision is needed. A yes or a no, never a yes and no at the same time. Therefore, an event conjures the classical form of negation. It demands the power of exclusion and the power of decision. If an event is nothing but the ensemble of the consequences that it yields, one can claim that these are only measured by the fact that one either said yes or no to the forced choice that it had necessitated, and also by what follows from the acceptance of the choice or, again, the indifference towards it. Therefore, an event is diagonal towards the three uh, forms of negation. So one can state that an event is a sudden change, um, to go into detail, of the laws that regulate the realm of appearance. Something that seemed impossible now appears in the form of a formerly unthinkable possibility. Therefore, it is not directly the creation of something new, rather the creation of a new formerly non-existing possibility. If it were the creation of something new, it would be mainly destructive. But in this way, it also enables the integration of something old into the construction of something new as an unfolding of the consequences of this very possibility. This is why it is imperative for any beginning of communism to take the already existing experiences into account. The greatest change that an event can inaugurate is the transformation of something that does not appear in the world, for example, non-A does not appear in it, into something that appears in a world, into A, for example. This transformation is eventual and follows the classical logic. At the same time, the consequences of the event have to be thought through from the perspective of the two other logics, the intuitionist and the paraconsistent one. Either the consequences of the event are classical, non-A appears instead of A, or intuitionist, non-A appears as B, which does not replace the appearance of A by the appearance of non-A, or finally, the consequences of the event are paraconsistent. In this case, the fundamental framework of appearance is respected, the distinction of A and non-A is not touched at all. From the perspective of the world, everything remains the same. The event and the non-event are identical, and the consequences are null. The event is none, one might say. If any word of appearance is organized intuition intuitionistically, also I cannot pronounce this word, uh, then any real action must follow the classical logic of negation. Pseudo-actions clearly follow the paraconsistent logic. True action has to be organized classically and mobilizes the double power of negation, of exclusion and forced decision. But the development of consequences of the exclusive decision take place in an intuitionist regulated world in which multiple ways and alternatives of their materializations are possible or thinkable. This is necessary not to think that one single yes or one single no is a sufficient ground for all consequences. And it has to be remarked that an event, 
due to the fact that it generates within the phenomenal world the form of a classical negation is not shared by anyone, by everyone. Not everyone answers the forced choice with a yes. Some remain untouched, for example. One needs to think a relation be between the three logics because the ontologically paraconsistent event appears as classi classical negation, something has happened or hasn't happened, and there is no third option, within an intuitionist framework in which a multiplicity of consequences are possible, and at the same time there is a paraconsistent opposition to them because not everyone shares the initial yes as answer to the false choice. And also within the procedure, or this is why, also in the procedure of unfolding the consequences, which but you calls fidelity, there is always a temptation to transform the yes or no into a yes and no. Yes, something has happened, but no, I don't have to draw consequences from it. The first yes has to be repeated in the situation that already changed to the, due to the consequences of this yes. The subjective determinate affirmation, as one might call it, flirting with Hegel, the yes has to be up to sustain itself, to sustain classicism facing a world that changes through the consequences that are already enfolded in it, and how that is to be done is not foreseeable or deducible, but it will have been possible to do so. This is what philosophy reminds us of. The yes has to be sustained, although it is unforeseeable how, and might even seem impossible. Only in this way, the contingent emergence of a new possibility can retroactively gain consistency, or to put it differently, only via the consequences that are unfolded step by step through the continuity of, although this is a weird word, yeses, an event can retroactively be con considered as what it will have been, and in this sense, gain some sort of objectivity. Objective is only what will have been objective by the retroactive effect of the consequences that are nothing but the sustained classicism of subjective determinate affirmations in a changing world that only changes precisely due to the effects of these determinate affirmations. One can also say that the constant upholding of the subjective determinate affirmation of the emergence of the retroactively objective classical negation inside the intuitionist framework and against any paraconsistent temptation is a dialectic development that always replies, uh, relies upon something that is not itself dialectically deducible. An event, this is precisely what an event is, is that which is not dialectically deducible. If the consequences that change the world are engendered by an event, which is itself nothing, but what it will have generated to not fall back into extra extrapolating only one form of negation, for example, the intuition, I can really, not pronounce this word, intuitionist one, one has to insist upon the following claim. Materialist dialectics to remain materialist has to introduce something that cannot be deduced dialectically for the event in any other way would be substantialized. It is this relation between the three negations uh, that presents the matrix of uh, a new dialectical conception as Badiou claims. It is dialectical as it is the relation of different types of negation and it's materialist because it considers the concrete consequences produced by the relations of the negation. Why is, the, <clears throat> why is this new dialectical ske skeleton necessary today? Because as one might say of the historical specificity that conditions us. We are thinking after Plato so one <clears throat> cannot uphold the conception of truth or the idea which considered it to be given pre-given, after Descartes, God cannot be any guarantee, and after Hegel, there cannot be a self-unfolding of the idea as temporalization that is historical development. It is clear there are no pre-given ideas, no already, uh, already existing truths, and not one truth of history. We have to think historically and, speci historically and specific and materialistically. It is we who are the ones to produce them. We are the ones responsible for our own destiny, as one might say, it might happen here, occupying Wall Street. It might happen there, uh, in the Arab world. But philosophy returning to Plato, Descartes, and Hegel has to remind us that we're able to produce truths, eternal ones. Thus, one still has to remain faithful to what has been bequeathed to us by the three of them, the idea of truth and the absolute. What follows from this is materialist dialectics, not to fall back into the specific shortcomings of previous versions of dialectical thought put into pro political practice within the attempts to re realize the communist hypothesis has to be understood as a procedure of unfolding consequences. It has to itself remind itself constantly that this unfolding is grounded in something that due to the logic of retroactivity logically lies before it, although it is only accessible 
that means objective after the unfolding. Materialist dialectics, not to totalize dialectical movement, not to totalize dialectics, and therefore to hypostatize only one form of negation has to be a dialectics of dialectics, drawing of consequences, and non-dialectics, the contingent emergent of a new possibility. Um, this is what I call, or want to call, dialectics of dialectics and non-dialectics. But what does all of this teach us for my claim that philosophy should be metacritical analysis? As you may know, for but you, philosophy stands in the position, for example, of meta-ontology with regards to its scientific condition, and of metapolitics with regards to its political condition. I want to claim that from this follows that philosophy attempting to intervene into a concrete situation cannot, it cannot simply be critical. It has to be metacritical. If it were to be only critical, it would still be linked to the situation, dialectically insisting on possibilities which, has not, which have not yet been realized, for example, or distinguishing what is and is ought to be from what should be realized in the future. It would draw a distinction in the sense of the Greek chinein, maybe analyze tendencies as Ernst Bloch did it, uh, and in one way or the other would rely and stick to only one form of negation as motor of transformation. It would be bound to the given realm of the possible, but subtracting it from this bond means to insist that not everything, not any form of change is dialectically deducible. There is a change that from the imminence of a given situation seems necessarily seems impossible. To affirm power consistency against the materialist democratic way is essential, but it needs to be thought ontologically, not yes and no is the form of power consistency, but it needs to be thought ontologically, not intuitionistically. It is that which forces a choice, forces us to be free, so to speak. <clears throat> Therefore, philosophy has to affirm the contingent, unforeseeable, and scandalous emergence of a new un impossible um, uh, possibility, of an event which is not dialectically deducible. This is why philosophy, as metacritical analysis, has to comprise an element of dialectics of dialectics and non-dialectics, and we can discuss why I think that it's still a dialectics of these two terms and not a non-dialectic relation. A metacritical stance a name again advocated by Lorenzo Chiesa for the first time, is necessary as thereby philosophy turns itself onto itself and draws a line of demarcation against re reactionary tendencies within its own field. It is self-critical, philosophical torsion against fake dialectics, I want to say. But also it has to take into account that under changed historical conditions, the means to remind the human animal of the possibility of the impossible need themselves to be renewed. Thus. It is not a critique of the present, but a critique of the mean, means to recall the impossible. And thus, it has to work for the renewal of those means as working through of dialectics and negations. To conclude, so, so far, from remembering Descartes, metacritical analysis can gain means to understand the human animal as natural embodiment of a natural freedom. From remembering Plato, metacritical analysis can gain the conception of a life under an idea and the idea of an idea. From repeating Marx via working through Hegel, it can gain the conception of a renewed dialectical model as renewed means to recall the impossible possibility of an event. What does all this come down to? How can today a metacritical analysis concretely counter democratic materialism? Answer my answer in three points. First, it is putting up against the reactionary animal humanist politics of domestication, a politics Who's, who, which is relying on values like discipline, equality, freedom, strict organization. For remembering the impossible means to also start with a determinate affirmation. It affirms communism as truth within politics. Philosophy can affirm that the communist hypothesis presents the only thinkable idea of politics. And if it can, it must affirm it. It must affirm that the individual is not necessarily surrendered to the state. It must affirm that a new singular collective creation of possibilities is itself possible. And it must affirm that the name communism is not forever doomed. It must affirm that we have experiences, and it has to insist on the fact that we have them by affirming that there is a we. It must affirm the impossible possibility of a communist we. And if we have such experiences, we have to do everything in our power to continue producing and creating them. Remember, the imperative of an ethics of truth is simply to continue. 
This is an amnetical affirmation. It's an aff is an affirmation addressed to everyone. A concrete singular affirmation of the existence of communist experiences it is at the same time a universal collective affirmation, for it is an affirmation of their internal transtemporality, their truth. Against the fetishism of failure, so dear to liberals, libertarians, or social chauvinists, as Lenin liked to say, metacritical anamnesis has to uphold this form of affirmation of a singular collective we that is of communist nature. This is why at least in, for, in and for philosophy, one should determinedly affirm that we can and so we must be communist. Second, if we are politically in the same situation as Marx was in the 1840s, as I claimed, uh, for philosophy, we seem to be in a comparable situation to Descartes in the 1640s. Thus, metacritical anamnesis has to repeat the Cartesian gesture against indifference under changed conditions. What can this mean? But you has articulated a radical diagnosis of the present in the following form. The 21st century has not yet begun. The reason is, as he claims, that we're still thinking, for example, within the political field, in terms of the 20th century. We, for example, still refer to the word revolution in a way Lenin and Mao did, although it became completely obscure for us. This is one reason why he calls our times a time of disorientation. This orientation then can be rendered also as being one direct effect of the ideological predominance of the fake two of democratic materialism over any materialist dialectical stance. We're all lost in the ossified realm of bodies and their pathological constitution in the woods of the commerce of language, the alleged complexities of our individualities and their relationship to the communities we think to belong to even if we're arbitrarily born into them. To counter this but you turns to Descartes, and I think one should repeat this gesture. Um, but one, what can one get from him today? I want to suggest that he offers means to come up with a different indifference against the indifference produced by democratic materialism. So against the disorienting indifference of the fake two, one needs to put up what I would like to call a subtractive indifference of a true two, which is constitutive for any true orientation of thought. The subtractive indifference minuses, as Descartes did, subtracts doubts, all the seemingly unavoidable particular differences and naturalization of the there is. But you has outlined uh, what this means, uh, or what this act of subtractive indifferentiation today can mean. And these are first momentums for a concrete subjective stance against democratic uh, materialism. One needs A, an indifference with regards to numbers. Second, and indifference with regards to the established regime of the possible. Third, an indifference with regard to particularities. Fourth, concerning the alleged antinomy between the authoritarian and the tolerant. And fifth, concerning the separation of repetition and projection. The first, uh, with regards to numbers, insists that a majority is in itself not a criterion of truth, a point already Descartes articulated. Ten militant people can count more than a zillion of passive ones. The second one, uh, indifference towards the regime of the possible. The second one insists that the possible is a regime of repression and oppression. The third one, um, with regards to particularities, um, that a truth can only begin from something which is valid for anyone and disregard particularities and disregards fundamentally uh, at, at the starting point all the particularities and difference of the different life worlds. The fourth one, um, claims that one cannot know in advance which form of discipline, which form of authority will have been adequate as any idea generates its own norms and one can never know in advance if someone will get hurt. Um, this, for example, maybe some people know from love encounters. The fifth or finally, one finally insists that an exception is neither a simple repetition, it is not a tradition, nor a pure projection, as the idea of newness is as is well known, always threaten to become a nicely marketable product. The exception, rather, is the synthesis of repetition as something unthinkable or impossible within a given historical situation already has taken place a couple of times before, and projection, a synthesis of singularity and universality. All these indifferences are needed for a metacritical analysis that insists that there is a possibility of the impossible, the contingent occurrence of an absolute contingency which follows, for, <clears throat> which allows for the doability of the unthinkable. Thus, 
Philosophy in times of disorientation does not have a critical duty in any traditional sense. It not only takes a distance toward the world of the there is, it has to come up with a renewed notion of contingent emergencies of the absolute, of our a natural freedom, and it can only do so by remembering that it already has taken place several times under different historical conditions, i.e. by remembering communism. Thus, philosophy has to be Cartesian in a renewed way. It has to be a Cartesianism for the 21st century, in some sense, one might say, to come. This metacritical stance can take propagating the thinkability of unthinkable communism. Um, it can take this metacritical stance in reminding the human animal that it can act in a human, and one might even say human, inhuman way. We thus not only have to change the world of bodies, languages, individuals, and communities, but also by becoming indifferent towards certain aspects of them, we also have to change ourselves. Because we can. And we can because we already did. Philosophy recalls actions of the impossible, thoughts of the unthinkable under changed conditions. This is metacritical anamnesis, and then a 21st century might begin someday. And metacritical anamnesis might be <clears throat> said is a preparation for this very beginning. To resume and conclude with my last point, what metacritical analysis takes up from idealism under materialist conditions is the idea of truths. This is what philosophy always as philosophy, and to remain philosophy, will be conditioned by. It is still materialism as it agrees that there is nothing but bodies and languages, but as it is dialectical, it introduces an exception into what there is. It relies on the dialectics of the exception. It is formalist as it is conditioned by the form of the idea of truth. A truth stands in exception to the realm of the simply given. But the dialectics of the exception has also been thought dialectically. It's the dialectics of dialectics and non-dialectics, not to totalize dialectics. Because in reminding us, the human animals, philosophy reminds itself, or to put it differently, it asserts and defends the impossibly, impossible seeming possibility of truth, which is the only task philosophy throughout its history, given all the different interpretations, mostly had. But in self-asserting itself and reminding itself of its role, philosophy can counter one threat, the disappearance, one might say, of one condition, of one field of practice, of emancipatory politics itself. For if there is only universalized indifference and survivalist animal humanism, politics disappears becomes a mixture of administration and corruption, for example. Metacritical analysis is thereby self-affirmation. But in affirmation itself, it affirms something else. Truths that it is conditioned by and truths that are never philosophical. They always emerge in extra-philosophical domains of practice, in politics, for example. Philosophy being self-affirmative, metacritical analysis, finding new means to remind us of our capacities, our a natural freedom, of the possibility to live a life under an idea affirms the impossible possibility of the existence of, co uh, of politics, i.e. communism. This is why I think that one answer to the question this conference addresses, communism a new beginning, question mark, taken up as a philosophical question, can be. One condition for a new beginning of communism is the self-assertion, die Selbstbehauptung, of philosophy as assertion of the impossible possibility of the existence of emancipa emancipatory politics. The name of it right now could be, maybe always will be, communism. So communism, a new beginning? Yes. And one element of this beginning is a self-assertion, is a self-assertion of philosophy in a metacritical and anamnetical sense. Thank you. I warrant you, it is philosophy that you will get here, not deep course. Okay, so uh, I am not sure how this will function, you mean, but. Should I be standing or am I allowed to sit down? Yeah, conditionally, yes, yes. <laughs> if your answers will not be good, you okay. have to stand up there, okay? So uh, I think there are mics there, at least there is one, so please, questions. But. Questions, not self-declarations, please. Questions, not self-declarations.
I mean, I mean, I was uh, basically wh what happens after everyone thinks that to speak of something like an eternal truth comes down uh, to taking a completely ludicrous position. Uh, what happens if the concept of eternal truth or something comparable to that, which uh, thinkers like Plato, Descartes, or Hegel in some way or the other try to uphold, um, is or did become or becomes impossible. And one claim I wanted to make is, or this is one uh, essential claim, that there then is a naturalization of what we have, of the there is. And this naturalization today functions in a way that was already described by Descartes as production of indifference. So um, in a certain sense, the very historically specific mode of naturalizing that there is, um, is a production of indifference, which is linked to different forms of other naturalization, reduction of us to our bodily constitution and stuff I talked about. So I would not say that this is the truth of the situation in a certain sense, but it's a direct effect of the absence of something which is not only historically relative or historically specific. This was in, in some sense the first, let's say, diagnostical part. And then I wanted to suggest that and this is an idea already Sartre developed when he was reading, uh, when he was reading Descartes, that this sort of indifference can be countered by a different form of indifference, by making oneself indifferent to what seems to be the only possible things, the only possible options, the only, let's say, um, or naturalized hierarchies. I don't know, uh, 10 people voting for option A are uh, better than three people voting for option B or something like that, uh, to question these form of naturalizations. And this was, uh, at least at the end, um, how I conceived or how I was, um, um, or what I wanted to present as one counter means against the naturaliza naturalization which relies on the production of indifference, a different form of indifference. Um, so a subjective stance that can be taken against certain things that seem as if they could not be differently. Is that? Okay. Uh, just if you are underprivileged those in the back, <laughs> somehow made your presence more felt, please. But wait a minute, this is not fair. Maybe you should go there because again, those in the backwards probably don't have not even an idea what is like. Let's at least give them a chance. That is this on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. oh. okay. Um, since the impossible is impossible to articulate within the present moment, is there a parallel structure between that and the the process of the event? That is, uh, if the event is only discernible by its consequences, and then if, or is that the same thing? So. Okay, I mean, this was the reconstructive part that I, or this was my attempt to read, um, or my attempt to reconstruct what but you um, formulate in the stream negations text. I mean, basically, the events, and this is three characteristics one can give, the event is the emergence of a new possibility, which, before didn't seem to be possible. So secondly, this possibility appears in a way, or the, the emergence of, pos uh, of this possibility has to be thought as, and these are, uh, let's say, comparable uh, definitions or formulations for that, as coincidence of appearance and disappearance, of being and nothing. Um, and third, this, would not, uh, this is why it's a Paradox, paradoxical definition or par paradoxical multiplicity or paradoxical entity. This, the second claim is uh, essential not to substantialize it. It's not the hidden kernel or whatever uh, or the negative substance which breaches forth. Uh, and the third definition is 
how to measure if a possibility was really a possibility by its consequences. So in a certain sense, um, and then it gets a bit more complex, but someone is faced after a ni nice evening out uh, with a simple decision of yes or no, should I change my life after I met this woman? And of course you can be mistaken, quite simply. So there is no objective guarantee to that. Maybe, I don't know, uh, she's a liar or deeply unfaithful or a hidden man, whatever. Um, so there is no objective. <laughs> Do you like that? Is this your experience? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying. Um, so there are no objective criteria. This is why it's really a forced choice which generates something new. But there needs to be for, it is not uh, abstract idealism of someone just like deciding upon something, there needs to be an encounter which makes it possible for there to be a choice. But this encounter, a vanishing mediator somehow, is nothing but what, the, what a subject makes out of it in a certain sense. So, so there is a mutual interdependence. And then there's an attempt, or the, necessarily there's an attempt to continue with the first, yes, I have to change my life, I need to change something, I don't know, one moves in, buys pets, uh, I don't know, takes a couple of holidays, whatever. Um, so, but this is consequences of, let's say, a decision which what the subject was able to take, or an individual was able to take, because something happened to um, and only retroactively, um, one can say, okay, when this night at the bar, this was a true event. Maybe, I mean, maybe it goes wrong or whatever, but yeah. Sorry, uh, can I uh, then monopolize for two minutes time and then before we make a break, you will still get a chance. I really cannot restrained from us. First, let me say that how I found a couple of points quite admirable. First, that you focused briefly on this figure of Hegel as the thinker of recognition. And th there is something very interesting happening here, if some of you follow this, how till recently liberalism and Hegel didn't go along too well. We had the proto-fascist, reactionary Hegel, the first big Hegel, big figure of this were the British neo-Hegelians, Bradley and so on, Hegel as kind of proto-fascist, organicist, Hegelian state, hierarchic uh, order of estates, everyone at its place, and then the revolutionary Hegel. The first figure of it was maybe not even Marx, but more Bakunin, hmm. this idea of immediately, brutally even, transposing Hegelian negativity into the force of social uh, destructivity. What we are getting now is finally, but not in the sense of release, I'm opposed to it as you are, a third Hegel, a liberal Hegel. And I think the sign of recognition, would you agree then, is double. On the one hand, this precisely focus on the notion of recognition, which I think incidentally totally mystifies mm -hmm. Hegel. Maybe you find recognition in early Hegel, all this stupidity of on love and so on, whatever, but later Hegel can absolutely not be reduced to love. And second thing, I think, is an apparent materialist gesture, which I opposed. It is the, let's call it a, a ontological deflation of Hegel. Mm. You know, the story which usually goes with this, look at the one for whom I have high respect, otherwise Robert Pippin, is basically to say, forget about all that metaphysics and so on, we can all be naturalists, man evolves, blah, 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 and uh, like, as if, forget about all the big ontological claims of Hegel, Hegel simply just ultimately described a certain, in, a certain intersubjective practice of human animals, to put it like this. So, I am opposed to this. Second thing, I just want to make you uh, aware of how important is this triad that you mentioned, Plato, Descartes, Hegel. Now you will say what brings them together. Ah, a wonderful feature. I, uh, that each of them marks a point of beginning which is immediately discredited as impossible. Don't be afraid, I'm not bullshitting with 
the conceptual, this, it's something very simple. Michel Foucault, I hate him otherwise, but nonetheless, he proposed a very good definition of philosophy. It's the way to take distance towards Plato. All philosophers practically have, like, you know, from Aristotle, no, no, Plato was wrong, ideas, more nominalist, up to neo-Platonists, uh, neo Plotin, and so on. So that they define, a they open up a new field, but in a negative way. They open up a field of asserting philosophy, but precisely as a way to reject them. And exactly the same goes for Descartes. My God, everyone, you ask a vulgar Marxist, no, Descartes, abstract cogito, real productive people. You ask a new ager, oh my God, Descartes, men exploit nature. We have to have a harmonious attitude towards nature, whatever, holistic stuff. You ask a Heideggerian, uh, no, Descartes, abstract, we need concrete, concrete temporality of Dasein and so on and so on. So again, the whole field of after Descartes is a way to negate Descartes and useless to mention the same goes even more for Hegel. It is as if all the post-Hegelian philosophy is a distance towards Hegel. And the truly daring gesture here that you make, but you, Alain, makes it and I try to make it is to say no, F3.8. Precisely we should return to this impossible point. Precisely to break this field of impossibility founded on this in, uh, 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 exception. Then democratic materialism and uh, I think, wouldn't you agree, there is another way to claim that the, 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 uh, the uh, distinction materialism, idealism returns in it. I take this claim very seriously because don't we have in today's popular academic ideology, precisely two orientations which may appear radically exclusive of each other, like this exploded violently in the so-called Sokal affair, but nonetheless I claim there are two faces of the same coin. On the one hand, we have this big return of a certain pretty vulgar neo-Darwinian vulgar materialism, you know, all the Steven Pinker stuff and so on, which brutally makes fun of all discourse analysis as French madness and so on. And then we have discourse analysis, which is precisely the total annihilation of ontological questioning. You know, if you speak with a truly fanatical discourse analyst and you ask him, I don't know, uh, what is this book materially, he will tell you, no, the only reasonable question is under what discursive conditions can we talk about sometime, something like this book, what power relations are involved in it, and so on and so on. So what I claim is that this is the defining antinomy of democratic materialism. Either you opt for ontology, but it's a pretty vulgar vulgarly materialist ontology, or you fall into this uh, uh, discourse analysis suspension of, uh, of ontological question as such, and precisely there is no way to bring the two together precisely because they belong to it. Now, very brief, I'll be a promise, two, two slightly, slightly more aggressive questions. First, can you elaborate a little bit about this? and you as the other earthly representative of Alain, but you maybe, uh, I can also ask you, you said, okay, we are materialists, there, all there is, is bodies, communities, languages, whatever, but there are exceptions. Of course, we are materialists. That is to say, this exception is not to be read as literally exception, like there are bodies, but if you look really close, oh my God, there is a soul there or whatever. No, <laughs> you don't mean that. So nonetheless, the problem is, and I think it can be solved with some notion of virtuality in more Lacanian sense, of how to think this, I even don't like the term exception, this other dimension, in what sense? For example, I think that uh, for me, and this is how I read Alain's par problematic statement, if you don't understand it properly, when he says that, of course, we are materialists, so an event is 
nothing but a torsion in the order of being. The way I read it, would you agree, is like this. You said very nicely that an event is just discernible in the series of its consequences, which means inscriptions into the order of being. So I would say that everything there is positively are bodies, languages, blah, blah. There is something more, and this more is a purely virtual zero, but zero which has effects. An event doesn't have a positive ontological consistency in itself. There are no ideas outside of us, people practicing the ideas. But nonetheless, so ideas are alive only through us. But nonetheless, this doesn't mean the humanist nominalist vulgarity. That's crucial that you know, oh, we are the authors of ideas and so on. There must be an order which, again, is not reducible to material reality, but which also is not another positive order. This I see as a task. How to think ontologically this accepts. And the very last point, maybe I should explain it to you because he was much closer to our daily experience than it appeared. You know, to give an example of what Alain means with these three types of negation. He takes a very nice example of ethical struggle. Like, classical logic is, you are either right or wrong, guilty or not. No bullshitting, no third version. Uh, the, uh, this intuitionist approach would have been, this legalistic twist. Yeah, you may be technically guilty, but when you were young, if you are a woman, your father raped you and the blah, 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 so you are not quite guilty, you are guilty with circum... You know what I mean, like this. Now, paraconsistence, the most interesting, would be where you are either guilty or not, but like some theologists like to do, when they say, since we are fallen creatures, the only way to be innocent is to admit your guilt. The greatest sin, guilt, is to claim that you can be directly innocent and so on. Okay, so as you know, nonetheless, I, th I think that, and that's how I would try to simplify you, that we should nonetheless opt for the fourth notion, which I claim maybe Alain dismisses too fast as nonsensical. We just have to, let's start with classical uh, opposition, either we or them. This is the pure Stalinist class struggle, two classes which will win. But I think what we should do here is to listen closely to what Marx said. Marx never speaks like that. Marx says something very interesting. He says that the only pure, real class as such in the history of humanity is bourgeoisie. Before, they were not yet classes, there were more estates, labor, whatever, castes. After, proletariat is not for Marx simply a class, but it is a class, a kind of a paraconsistent class, if you want. Class which is in itself a negation of the very being of a class. In other words, if I may quickly refer to Lacanian logic of non-all, uh, while every non-bourgeoisie non is a proletarian, while from the bourgeois standpoint, this logic holds. You are not with us, you are against us. Every non-proletarian is not bourgeoisie. You have this typically non-all opening. The negation of bourgeoisie gives you a proletarian, the negation of proletarian doesn't give you a bourgeoisie. So in this sense, I claim a position which, again, violates, violates both intuitionist and uh, paraconsistent position, that is to say, uh, violates at the same time uh, uh, excluded third and uh, principle of contradiction, can nonetheless be, I think, uh, advocated as not simply an, an, an empty notion. All we have to do, but I will stop now in five seconds, is to introduce a certain logical temporality, maybe, into this. You know that negation is not just negation. It has to have a certain temporality. You can do something only after doing something else before. I'm very sorry, so I will now really stop. You know what? Because I feel bad. Is there any other, please, question? And then you can ignore me and after. Because I really, here I am a bourgeois democrat. Do I see you correctly back there? Yes, please. Yeah. Yell, yeah. yell, yell.
Um, I mean, of course, the extension and expansion of the possible follows uh, temporal logic and so forth. Uh, the point I wanted to make is, I mean, the possible as, let's say, the category in for explaining and for detecting means, places, uh, of transformation has, I mean, quite a long history. Uh, but what seems to be problematic, at least, when the hegemonical model of thinking or presenting transformation is synonymous with there is a ever, let's say, a gradual uh, expansion of the possible is that one thing is necessarily implied as impossible, the uh, change of that model of change itself. So this is where the category of impossibility comes. So this model of change, expansion of the uh, possible that are not yet actualized, possibilities that are not yet actualized or realized, um, is somehow naturalized, becomes a transcendental, one might say, and it becomes comes with quite concrete empirical uh, consequences. Like, I don't know, we can't realize that right now, maybe in 10 years, you should wait, certain conditions have to be created, something like that. So the impossible is, uh, let's say, a category which, in, which I introduced or referred to in that moment to counter the naturalization of only, or the transcendent, transcendentalization of only one model of change. So to introduce a moment, because, and this is, what the, let's say, identification of transformation with the expansion of the regime of uh, possibility uh, comes down to everything that is possible will become necessary. So, and then, like also empirically, uh, what that means is the tr mo mode of transformation you accept is the mode of reforms, for example. So, um, to counter that, the, uh, uh, category of impossibility seems to be valid from my perspective because if something that seems impossible becomes possible and one does not introduce that there is a, let's say it means a, a similar transcendental or whatever framework uh, even on a higher on a meta level that works in the same sense if the impossible becomes possible something new becomes possible so no, go ahead. No, no, because, again, I'm sorry, but I really, because you uh, erased an important question. My answer, I wonder if you agree, would have been a very brutal one, which is that simply we should not read Hegel like that. The traditional reading of Hegel is that he is the ultimate philosopher of a closed circle of possibilities. Like, you know, everything that becomes for itself developed is already in itself at the beginning, so the whole development of the absolute idea is just a deployment of the possibilities which are already there. I claim this is not the right reading of Hegel. I claim Hegel is much more a thinker of contingency and every necessity or progress is always a retroactive progress. Something which is contingent retroactively becomes necessary. Like to take your own example, that you obviously like to go to bars and pick up girls and so on, you know, <laughs> when you really fall in love, it retroactively, you retroactively experience it that, oh my God, for all my life I was waiting for it and so on and so on. The, the true Hegelian insight is not the necessity of contingency in the sense of the idea in its necessary self-development externalizes itself in contingency. It's the contingency of necessity. That's, I know, for some a problematic reading of Hegel. Another thing, you know, uh, think about it. Sorry? The recuperation. Yes, but this recuperation is in itself contingent, I claim. <laughs> Sorry? I claim it is, because otherwise, okay, I cannot go into it now in detail, but I claim absolutely, this is why Hegel, for example, absolutely insists on this 
what is usually taken as a reactionary motive, no? Of uh, uh, philosophy can only come afterwards, the all of Minerva takes off in the evening and so on. Why? Because for Hegel, here I am for Hegel against Marx to be brutal. Because for Hegel, the idea that there is some kind of permanent historical necessity where you as an agent of history can grasp that necessity and act accordingly to it. Like, we know history moves at least towards, if not necessity, the objective possibility of communism, we should enact it. That's, Hegel was too materialist for that. For Hegel, we cannot ever occupy this position. Not because there is some higher necessity which we cannot grasp, which is simply that simply we cannot grasp. If we do this, then this means that we live in that, that, that uh, substance still uh, is much higher than subject. Substance is there. No, it, it is because there is no necessity. There is no in advance necessity. Now we will say, but Hegel nonetheless presents at the end, yes, but he himself in a wonderful way Yeah. 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 Everything is No, uh, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, course of, of, of history. So there's no contingent contingency. Okay, listen, I promise because I, I, I would sell my mother into slavery if we were to be able to go on with this debate, <laughs> which is for me, I will say now something sinful, even much more interesting than all this communist stuff and so on, no? But okay, I will promise you that I will go into this at the beginning of my talk and then you attack again, we do it. Uh, just, no, but just the last point, please, to make clear, maybe this is a good example of this impossibility possibility. We are not dealing with magic, something important. Sorry? I go back to the first question. Communism today. Yeah. What do we do? When I was listening to the speaker, I heard that the only way I mean, this is, for example, where I think I vary from a lot of friends of mine, uh, for example, in the UK, because I do not really accept the distinction of philosophy and politics uh, in the sense that I, doing philosophy, you end up uh, with an academia or with a position of a master's discourse, and you can only be actively, let's say, working for uh, to renew what communism means when you opt, uh, uh, faced with that decision for the politics part. I think this is a too abstract way of rendering it for me because to insist on the necessity of philosophy is itself, can itself be a political move, not simply by, I mean, uh, take a look at what's happening in the UK with uh, the being threatened of philosophy departments and so forth. Uh, this would be on an empirical level, but what I, would uh, try to defend is that if philosophy, and this was a very specific take I presented, um, if the self-affirmation of philosophy comes with the affirmation that there can be something true, and philosophy to be and to self-affirm it affirms that there can be something true, in affirming itself, it necessarily affirms something else because truth does not come from within philosophy. So in a certain sense, in affirming itself, in dealing only with itself and so asserting itself via the form that is conditioned by something true happening, which as the all of Minerva it can only grasp after it happened, it affirms something outside philosophy. 
and this, for me, this was my claim, uh, can be politics, and the name of truth in politics can be communism. So in this, the self-affirmation of philosophy via the necessary implied co being conditioned by truth which comes from extra-philosophical fields of practices, it affirms communism. So it's not an anti-academic intellectual gesture. It is, I mean, uh, quoting or um, t uh, relating to what Slavi said at the beginning, the, to affirm the necessity and the possibility to think can itself be quite something. And this would be... I will do something brutal now. First, I will criticize myself. I talk too much. Point two, I have to stop now to give our absent comrade Alain a chance. So I propose if you have bodily needs and so on, you know which one, run now. You have seven minutes. <laughs> seven doesn't mean eight. <laughs> seven minutes. Then we go on with Alain.